and we are about to enter the Humayun's tomb by following through through this mighty western gate. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to one of the finest monuments of Delhi, the Humayun's tomb or the Makbara e Humayun. It's a beautiful garden tomb which was constructed in 1565 and nine years later finished in 1574. This was commissioned by Humayun's first wife and chief consort Empress Bega Begum, also known as Haji Begum. This is a place where Humayu rests in peace. And this entire Humayu's tomb is built in the format of Char Bagh, which is the four quadrant gardens which surround this place, along with the rivers, which represent the description of the paradise in Holy Quran. The architects who were hired by Bega Begum, Humayun's wife, for the construction of Humayun's tomb were Mirza Ghiyas and his son Saeed Muhammad. But it was a joint effort between Indo and the Persian architects, which really led to the construction of this magnificent Humayun's tomb. The whole complex in which the Humayun's tomb is located is around 27 hectares and the entire complex not only just houses the Humayun's tomb but is also known as a dormitory of the Mughal dynasty because around 150 different members of the Mughal family have been buried over here. This place gains a lot of archaeological significance because it is centered around the shrine of the 14th century Sufi saint Hazrat Nizamuddin Aulia and therefore it was considered by the Mughals to be auspicious to be laid alongside a Sufi saint's grave and therefore nearly 150 members of the Mughal dynasty were buried over here and of course Humayun was also buried over here and that's why this tomb is called the Humayun's tomb. You see on the dome on the top, it's made of marble, which was brought from Makrana, Rajasthan. You see these beautiful blue tiles, which were brought from Persia. And then we have this red sandstone of which the whole Humayun's tomb has been built. This was brought from Bharatpur and Dholpur in Rajasthan. It's a splendid example of the grandeur of the Imperial Mughal Empire which reached its architectural zenith in terms of the Indo-Persian architecture which finally culminated into the building of the Taj Mahal. And now we are going inside the core of the tomb and there's a steep ascent with a flight of stairs out here which is not for the faint at heart. And it's a big staircase and it's very steep. So you have to be careful while climbing this. We are right in front of this mighty monument, the Humayun's tomb. And it's at a pedestal. So after climbing over here, there's plenty of area out here. And it gives a fascinating view of the gardens and the gates right from the top. The gardens are beautifully manicured and the people are enjoying themselves. The gates look magnificent. They are wonderful palm trees. Everybody is enjoying themselves. And the entire view is overlooked by this mighty Humayun's tomb. We are now inside the core of the tomb and there you see it. The grave of the second Mughal Emperor, King Humayun. Again, there's beautiful windows out here with lattice work for good ventilation. There's a beautiful 
lamp which is posted right on top of the grave. Looks very solemn. And then of course we have the hallmark, the dome shaped ceiling out here, which itself looks magnificent and echoes the voice as the prayers are said aloud by the devotees. And in the complex of the Humayun's tomb, uh, we also have the tomb of Isa Khan, who was one of the commanders of Humayun himself. So this tomb was constructed in 1547 while Humayun was still in exile. It's uh, flanked by these beautiful palm trees. It's a beautiful day today, bright blue sky. And there's of course a garden out here, which is the hallmark of the entire Humayun's tomb complex. It would be interesting to know that uh, Isa Khan's dynasty uh, is followed by uh, uh, Imran Khan as well. Apparently Imran Khan and his family belong to the same dynasty, the Niazi dynasty. And have a look at this beautiful tomb of Isa Khan. Looks magnificent. It's housed uh, in an octagonal compound and looks absolutely marvelous. So this of course is the Isa Khan tomb which looks magnificent and right in front of it is, is a place of worship which is the Isa Khan mosque also built by Isa Khan himself with the belief that if you build a place of worship on this earth you will get a palace in the heaven when you die. On the top this Isa Khan tomb, you can see these beautiful carvings out here. Uh, for example, the carvings are mentioning the word Allah and they're also having sunflowers. So that's an example of the Indo-Persian architecture moving in tandem. There are also beautiful carvings out here in floral patterns where once upon a time it was filled in with emeralds and the rubies, but when the British took over in 1857, all this was of course looted and taken away. But this tomb stands tall as a testament to the splendor and the magnificence of the Mughal Empire. So we are now into the core of the Isa Khan's tomb. And as you can see, this is the grave of Isa Khan along with uh, his two wives and the children which he had with those wives. This entire tomb has got plenty of ventilation through this uh, latticework windows and it's a high dome out here which has a very nice pattern right on the top which looks beautiful. And the reason why this high dome has been architected is because when the prayers were done, then the prayers used to echo so that everybody outside could listen to it. And therefore, for example, if I say the word Allahu Akbar right now, it would, it would echo. Let me give an example, Allahu Akbar. So that kind of echoes and gives a magical feeling to all the prayers, to not only the people who are buried, but also to the people standing outside. So we are now entering the complex of the Homayu's tomb and you can see that this mighty wall appears to be broken and it was not broken until 1857. In fact, it was in 1857 when the last Mughal emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar took refuge into this complex out here. And then this wall was blown apart by the British troops to capture the last Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar and then they exiled him to Rangoon and hence started the long and arduous British Empire and the British Raj in India. And what we are seeing in front of us is the Bu Halima's tomb. Bu Halima was the Dai of, uh, of the Emperor when he was a young kid. And therefore, uh, it was in her honor that this uh, tomb was erected. And it was in her honor that the gate out here, which you see on, in front of us, 
is called the Bu Halima Gate. And what we are seeing over here in front of us is uh, the gateway to the Arab Sarai. Now naturally there was a whole workforce uh, of Indian and Persian architects and, and craftsmen and laborers who actually built the Humayun's tomb and its entire complex and all the other tombs which are housed in this mausoleum. And those guys used to live over here 24 cross 7 in this Arab Sarai and uh, both the Indians and the Persians lived together in harmony and built this beautiful complex, the Garden Mausoleum, which we are seeing in front of us, called the Humayun Tomb Complex. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the Humayun's tomb. So let us remember the second Mughal Emperor Humayun and something about him. Humayun was born in 1508 as the son of the first Mughal Emperor Babur and he was coronated as the second king of the Mughal Empire at a tender age of 22 years in 1530. As soon as he came to power he had to constantly fight with his brothers and the other rulers of the Mughal Empire and as a matter of fact in 1539 he lost the battle of Chosa against Sher Shah Suri and later on in 1540 the Battle of Kanauj and therefore had to flee India. In fact, he had to swim across the Ganges uh, with the help of a water skin. But he came back in 1555 and reconquered the Mughal Empire. Isn't it ironical that he couldn't survive long uh, in spite of being named as Humayun which means fortunate. He couldn't survive long to enjoy the Mughal Empire because in 1556 just six months down the line, he actually died. And how did he die? He was sitting atop the rooftop of his library called the Sher Mandal or the Din Panah. And he was discussing with his nobles and astrologers how to hold court when the planet Venus makes its appearance. And then he was climbing down the staircase of his library with a handful of books in his hand, in his royal robe. And right at that moment, there was the Azan which was announced. He immediately started to kneel down in reverence. And when he was kneeling down in reverence, his leg got entrapped into his beautiful robe. And he came tumbling down the staircase and his temple hit a stone edge. And three days later, he passed away. It was later when his son Akbar came to power after defeating Hemu that his remains were housed and laid to rest in this beautiful Humayun's tomb. And we also have this so-called Naika Magbara or the Barber's tomb uh, in this complex. And legend has it that when Humayun came to power, he had several enemies. So some of his enemies, uh, you know, tried to bribe Humayun's barber or Humayun's nai uh, that he can use his knife or the shaving knife or the shaving blade to uh, take the life of Humayun. However, uh, that barber was not a traitor. He was a faithful barber of Humayun and he duly reported to Humayun uh, that such was a conspiracy which was being plotted against him. And King Humayun was so happy with that barber that, uh, you know, in his remembrance, uh, he wanted a tomb to be built for him. And that's how this Naika Magbara was built out here. So overall, a wonderful and a very rewarding trip to the Humayun's tomb in Delhi. I really enjoyed the architecture by all means, but also its charbagh, the beautifully manicured gardens, which uh, really give you calm and peacefulness and with its beautiful trees which are themselves very ancient. Overall, lovely coming over here and I'm enjoying it as much as all these folks are visiting this heritage spot of Humayun's tomb. And with the Azan playing in the background, I bid adieu to you from Omayu's tomb.
and Delhi.